Happy, happy Sabbath to everyone. Oh, that was a really poor happy Sabbath. I feel bad for you guys. You didn't take a, take a breakfast in the morning? Happy Sabbath, church. That was a little bit of a happy Sabbath. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just want to read something for you before we start. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. It says, you are the light of the world. A city that can, it said on the high cannot be hidden. So we are a blessing to everyone. We should be the light of the world. We should be the one who bless other people. The time that we said, God bless you, is not that we are doing something for that person, but we are wishing the best for that person. And we are wishing that God can bless that person. So say the person next to you, God bless you. God bless you. We should be blessing other people as well, not just with the words, but also with our actions. And I hope during this service we can bless others, not just through the service, but what we are doing during the day. So let's pray, my friends. We got only one um, announcement. It's at 3.45. We're going to have an activity in the Appalachian Room. Uh, so if you want to join, you're invited to be at 3.45 in the Appalachian Room. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath. It's a different Sabbath because too many of our friends are in different places. They are singing and they are playing instruments. Please bless them. They are doing your work and they are blessing other people. But Lord, we want to ask for a blessing in here. We stay here at BMA and we want to have a blessed Sabbath. We want to be the light of the world. Uh, please bless us, bless the service, bless the songs, and bless everything that we are doing, not just for ourselves, but for you, Lord. Thank you for everything. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. <laughs> Happy Sabbath. So this morning I will be talking for you about how to optimize your brain. The first step is exercise regularly. Exercise increases the blood flow to your brain, enhancing your memory and cognitive function. Regular exercise also has the remarkable ability to counteract the natural decline in brain connections that, that, that typically accompany like, in reducing some of the problems with thinking and memory that come with getting older. Exercise has many known benefits and regular physically uh, activity also benefits the brain. Multiple researches, studies show that physical active people are less likely to experience a decline in their mental function and have a lower risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Get, get plenty of sleep. Aim for seven to eight consecutive hours or sleep for nine, not for mental sleep of two or three hour increments. Consecutive sleep gives your brain the time to consolidate and store your memories effectively. Try to have a good rest. Uh, for that, you can have like a good energy the next day, and that could be great for you in a few years. Eat a healthy diet. Your diet plays a large role in your brain health. Consider following a Mediterranean diet or a whole food plant based whole grains. Fresh fruits and vegetables. Healthy fats such as olive oil, beans, lentils, and peas. It incorporates less red meat and salt that are typically American diet. Also, it's important to include in your diet omega-3, like flat seed, chaya seed, and hemp seeds are good sources of omega-3. Step four, stay mentally active. Your brain is also to a muscle. If you don't use it, you will lose it. 
There are many things that you can do to keep your brain in shape, such as doing crossword, puzzles, reading, playing cards, or playing an instrument. So as you play an instrument, and also you have the ability to sing. So when you have like a lot of free time and also during breaks, you can practice a new shy music, you can praise the Lord, and also you can read a new book. And don't agonize. If the Bible were studied as it should be, it will become strong in intellect. The subjects traded open in the word of God, the dignifying simplicity of, of its utterance, the noble themes which it presents to the mind, develop faculties in us which cannot otherwise be developed. Finally, don't watch too much TV, as that is a passive activity and thus leader to stimulate your brain. Step number four. Number five, sorry. Remain socially involved. Social interaction helps ward off depression and stress, which can contribute to memory loss. Look out for opportunities to connect with loved ones, friends, and others. Texting is not in social media, it doesn't account. It needs to be face to face. Richard's link socially confinement to brain atrophy. So remaining socially active may have the opposite effects and strengthen the health of your brain. I know that we are uh, in a student boarding school, so it's difficult to us like uh, have a good like community with our parents because they are far away. So obviously we need to use our phones to be communicated with them. But also try to talk with them like in FaceTime and not only tense them. Keep Jesus in your thoughts at all times. Certain books in the Bible are really good for abstract thinking, which is known to be his for brain health. Dalian in Revelation, as you have to think about, interpret what is being said. Also, the book of Proverbs, you have to think about what is being said. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the so loud shall be under tribute. Proverbs 12, 14. There are 31 books in Proverbs, and it can be good brain exercise to read a proverb a day. I hope that you can apply one of as many of these points as possible into your daily life and remember to keep Christ at the center of your thoughts for optimal brain function. Thank you. God bless you.
happy Sabbath, everyone. So um, to start, we will be singing How Great Thou Art, hymn 86. of leading all the everlasting arms.
song we're gonna sing the Lord is in his only temple. to pray. It's Heavenly Father, we want to thank you once again for this beautiful Sabbath that you've given us. Please help us to be more like you and thank you because you have given us a new day of life. Um, help us to be able to enjoy the service and to be able to praise you. Also bless the speaker and that um, him speak not his words but only yours. Also um, bless every other person, every person that will be up um, praising your name up here and um, Help them to reflect you and only you. In your name I pray, amen. Um, happy Sabbath. Um, so today's offering appeal will go to Laura Lake Camp. Um, Donna attended a women's retreat weekend at Laura Lake Camp just to be with friends and get away from work and home. She knew her friends were Adventist Christians and had made it very clear to them that she would never become a Seventh-day Adventist, ever. She came with them just for the weekend away with friends. She didn't expect it to be, turning, to be a turning point in her life. She says, I was listening to them singing during worship, but not joining in, she shares. And something finally clicked. All the excuses and reasons just didn't seem valid any longer. For the first time, I sang in worship with my friends. Donna went home and began studying the Bible with her friends. She was baptized that spring and now is an active part of her local church. The beauty and peacefulness of Laura Lake Camp is a great place for people to not only get away and relax, but to be still and hear God and respond to his call on their hearts. Your financial support helps create a place where adults, children, and teens can learn and grow in their relationship with God. Please give generously to the Laura Lake Camp offering today. Amen. Uh, may the deacons uh, rise to receive the offering. All right, let's pray. Um, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this Sabbath that you gave us, Lord. Please, Lord, um, bless every person in this church. In this church, And please, Lord, I bless you to bless the offerings and make them be a blessing to Laura Lee Camp. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Let's bow our heads, our heads for pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful Sabbath and the opportunity to worship your name. We ask you for the people on tour, please take care of them and help them. Uh, please bless the service and bless the speaker of this morning and let the Holy Spirit touch our hearts. Thank you for all the blessings that you give to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite all the children to come up front for the children's story and the, and the children offering. So, so the story that I'm going to talk about is about a little girl, a daughter. When she went to school every day, she went by herself because she didn't want her friends to see her mother because she was embarrassed for her mother because her mother had black hands burn and a little bit of form and they were normal like others' moms had. And so every time that the mother went to the, the girl's school, she used to tell her friends that her, she wasn't her mother, but her maid. So she was really embarrassed of her mom. In the house, she used to talk really bad to her mom and say, why cannot you be like other moms? Why cannot you be normal? So one day in school, there was a school meeting for the parents, and her mother went. And so when her mother went, her friends asked her, what is your maid doing here? And she was like, the mother answered, like, I'm not the maid, I'm her mother. So when her friends knew that she wasn't her maid by her mother, everybody started laughing at her and making fun of her. And then the, in the house, the daughter started yelling at her mom, like, why do you need to embarrass me that way? Why cannot you be normal? Why are your hands like that? I don't like your hands. And my friend's mother, they have normal hands. Why cannot you be like them? And then the mother got sad, and then she told her, I'm going to tell you the story of why my hands are like this. So the mother told, when you were a little girl, the apartment that we were living in was burning and there was fire everywhere. And you were inside in a room and, the f and everybody was outside. It was only you in that fire. And the fireman told me that there was no possibility for anybody to go in without getting burned. And it was pretty bad. But because I loved you so much, I risked my life and I went into the apartment and I burned my hands opening the doors and getting a way to get to you and get you out of the apartment. So when the, mo when the daughter listened to that story, she went to her knees and then she started crying and saying, I'm sorry, mom, I love you. And that story got them closer. And the daughter realized that she was the luckiest girl alive because she has the best mom ever. So from this story, what can you say? You know, we sometimes tend to judge people because of their appearance. Sometimes, for example, let's say you go outside and you see a man with a motorcycle and he's full of tattoos. And what are you going to think? Oh, 
um, I'm a little scared of him because you know he looks like a bad guy. But what, what you don't what you don't know about him is that he can be the kindest person ever. But he just like tattoos on a motorcycle, you know. And so we sometimes tend to judge for their experience, and their actions are the one that talks about them. And you need to get to know them because men judge in the outside, like the Bible says, but Jesus judged in the inside, in their heart. And even we don't have to judge because that's God's job, you know. And like Jesus said, we need to love one another and love others like we love ourselves. And remember that like the mother loved the daughter all the time, no matter what, that's how Jesus is going to love us all the time. So does somebody wants to pray? I'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you because it's Sabbath and for the story. Please bless us, let us help and help in our character and love everybody like you love us. Please be with us and let us learn from Pastor Adam and be with us the rest of the day and forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can go back to your seats. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, so this hymn is in the Spanish hymnal. It's hymn number 99, and it's called Jamás Podrá Alguien Separarnos. It's personally one of my favorite hymns, and it's based on the verse in Romans 8, uh, verses 38 and 39, and it says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So, yeah, may the glory be to God. podrá alguien separarnos de Cristo nuestro Redentor ni cosa alguna arrebatarnos el gozo de no amor ni luchas pruebas o
Happy Sabbath, church. Yeah, I'll take that from you. Thank you. I was hoping that I would be able to get a few volunteers later in the sermon who'd be willing to read off the screen. Is there a few people? I think Stefan was willing to hand out a few mics. So when the time is right, Stefan, I'll call you up and you have, uh, you can come and grab some of the microphones. So I'll wait for my cue on that. I'm so excited to preach. feels like it's been a little while, but I'm glad, you know, most of my Bible classes get to hear me preach almost every day. So this is a good opportunity to, to share again with you guys. <clears throat> I was thinking about what I was going to preach about, and there was a bunch of things that were coming to my mind, but there was one thing I wanted to talk about that I think is really important, and as you can see on the screen, it says time. So before we get into the message, I want to just thank uh, Emma uh, for her great uh, message there last night and the special music, and we had Nicole did a great uh, children's story, and just so many people coming forward and, and helping out. We're just so thankful to have so many willing hands to serve in the Lord's vineyard and to share and be up front to be glorified, uh, to glorify our Father. So let's uh, take a quick minute here to pray and we'll get right to the message. Father in heaven, thank you that you've given us life and because we know Jesus, it is more abundantly um, experienced. And so Father, I pray at this time that you would speak through me. I know that uh, there's lots going on in this world uh, there's so much that is vying for our time, and yet when we look at the life of Jesus, he was able to prioritize his time so well, and when we look at him, I know that we can learn to um, use our time the way that you did. And so, Father, please be with me now. Uh, please take away any nervousness. Uh, please hide me behind your cross, and may you be lifted up, glorified, and may all others be drawn unto you. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to know the value of a year, ask a student who failed some core classes and has to come back and redo the same year. That would be really difficult, wouldn't it? If you want to know the value of a month, just ask the seniors how much time they have left here at this school. No amens there? Okay, amen. amen. Okay, there's a few seniors excited. They're about 30 some days away if you minus their class trip and all those kinds of things. They are looking at the clock, they're looking at the date, the calendar, and they know that their time here is short. If you want to know the value of three to seven days, ask a couple that was just put on social and they have to spend some time apart. Did you think they're counting the days? They're looking at the calendar a little bit? Is that true? For those who are guests here and they're like, what is social? You know, it's just when two individuals uh, from the opposite sex, seem to like each other a little bit. And we just think as an administration, they need a little bit of time to focus on their studies and things like that. But, but anyway, normal things. Um, if you want to ask the value of a day, simply ask a staff member when there's a day left before the next break and they get to have six or seven days off. Amen, staff? Amen? People know. They're looking at the time. They know when the time is at hand. If you want to know the value of an hour, doesn't it seem like rec and, and meal times just go so fast, and yet sometimes our classes can seem oh so long? Amen. The value of an hour. You shouldn't amen that. <laughs> if you want to know the value of a minute, just ask your RA if you hand your phone or your computer in a minute late after. Is that true, friends? Yes. And then maybe Sunday cleaning comes. Is, is there a value in just a minute? Of course. You know, if you want to know the value of a split second, ask the volleyball team during match point that isn't ready and doesn't react just perfectly, and they lose the very last point, and they get second place. Just that split second, that, that delay that can cost you the game. Time is something that is so valuable to us. We're told there are 3,600 sec 3, seconds in a day, 86,400 seconds Sorry, 86,400 seconds in a day, 3,600 seconds in an hour, 2,592,000 seconds in a month, and 31,556,926 seconds in a year. There we go. You know, we're told in this beautiful book called Gospel Workers, guard jealously your hours, not minutes, for prayer, Bible study, and self-examination. Set aside a portion 
of time each day for study of the scriptures and communion with God. Thus you will obtain spiritual strength and will grow in favor with God. He alone can give you noble aspirations. He alone can fashion your character after the divine similitude. Draw near to him in earnest prayer, and he will fill your hearts with high and holy purposes and with deep, earnest longings for purity, clearness, and thought. You know, God tells us that we should spend a lot of time with him, and I know that in a busy schedule, it can get very difficult. If you go to Ephesians 5, let's read the verse again that was read so well. Let's go to Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. Let's read that real quick. Take a look here. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 17. And the Bible says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. As we know, the Bible tells us that we're living in the hour or the time of judgment. And we know that Jesus is coming again one day very soon. And we have to sometimes search in our own hearts and see how do we use our time. Has anyone ever grabbed their cell phone and they get this alert once a week and it says time usage on your phone. And it tells you how many apps you've been opening, how long you've been on Instagram, YouTube, all these different things. And then sometimes at the very end it's like Ellen White Bible app, you know, four or five minutes, oops, I hope not. But we, actually, even technology can help us manage our time. <clears throat> you know, as a child, I valued gifts. I wanted things to play with. The older I get, the more I value time. You know, I have this really good friend, him and the person that he was with, in, in lieu of gifts, of giving you something, they would have friends that had children. They said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to come and we're going to babysit for you for like three or four days so you can have time off. Isn't that an amazing gift for parents? Amen. And so people look at time and they see how important it is. And the older you get, the realize, we realize the less that we get to experience it. <clears throat> you know, they actually interviewed people on their deathbeds. And they asked them what some of their greatest regrets were. And most of them said that they regret not spending enough time with their family. They didn't say, I wish I would have worked a little bit more overtime. I wish I would have collected one more boat or one more toy for the garage. They say, I wish I would have spent more time with my family and fixed any relationships that I had with people that weren't going so well. At the end of your life, many people regret how they used their time. We're told that we need to guard jealously those who we spend our time with. You know, there has been a study done on billionaires. Billionaires. Those people don't have, they, they may have problems, but they don't have money problems, right? And so people studied them, and they wanted to know what their routine was when they spent their time in the day. And they found that many of them would get up very, very early before the day started so they could organize their life, and they would know exactly what to do for the day. I'm not going to start naming a bunch of billionaires. I'm sure you can look it up and you know who some of these are. But many are up between 3.30 and 5.30 in the morning, and they're, they're making plans for the day. If you go to Mark 1.35, what did Jesus do before he started his day? Go to Mark 1.35. Let's see what Jesus did. He's our example. I think we should spend some time seeing what he did. Mark 1, verse 35. I hear still hear some pages turning, so I'll give you another five seconds. Now it says, in Mark 1.35, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. He made sure that he started his day with the most important thing, and that is prayer. It's important if Jesus did it, should we not also do it? Again, we're reminded that we are supposed to spend quite a bit of time with Jesus. Jesus made sure he knew what his plans were for the day. You know, Jesus, when he came onto the scene, he started saying something about time. He says, the time is fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. He was actually speaking about Daniel 9, where he was talking about this prophecy that was going to happen where he was going to be anointed. He was going to be called the Messiah, 
And it's one of the most, I think, powerful prophecies in the Bible. Now, sometimes we, we make sure we only have so many hours in the day. Did Jesus have time to talk to everyone he came into contact with? Not always, right? There was times where he actually said to, to even to his disciples in Matthew 10, 14, dust off your feet. Essentially, if they're not going to hear what you have to say, move on to someone who's, gonna have to, who's willing to hear what you have to say. And so there's times that we have to realize there are people that, though we can love them, we can't always give them as much time that we want. Important for us to remember that our time is valuable, that we can't give all of our time to everyone, just like Jesus. Jesus made the most of his time. When he was spending time with God, as it tells us in Mark 1.35, he would almost, I would guess, say something like this, Lord, who can I speak to today to make the greatest impact for your kingdom? And then he goes and he's thirsty, and God reminds him, I want you to talk to this woman, because when you talk to her, you're going to get a chance to talk to the whole city. God wants us to look for interested hearers, people who are willing to listen to the word of salvation at a time such as this. Now, one thing I learned is that, especially young people, one thing I wish I could do a little bit differently is there's one thing that can eat up your time more than anything. And at this time in in Earth's history and at the fork in the road where you're at, trying to avoid, it starts with D, ends in T, debt. Because here's the thing, there's nothing wrong with going to school. I'm never going to dissuade anyone from getting a degree or anything like that. But there is a way that sometimes we can try to avoid debt as much as possible. We're told that even some of the founders of our church, when they were going to publish books, there was times where they had to go into a bit of debt. We understand that. So I'm not condemning it. But we are supposed to try to stay away from it. Because when we get into debt, what happens is God might give us a desire or give us a mission, but then we say, God, I can't do that because I've got this other thing that I have to pay, pay down. And so, friends, if we're able, if possible, to stay out of debt, that's one thing that God says will help us use our time even more wisely. Now, I'm not saying you can't go to school, you can't take a student loan, but try to minimize it as much as possible. <clears throat> you know, I would say that when it comes to Solomon, he was a pretty wise man. Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll, get, I'll let you, uh, oh, you're coming up. You got something else to do. Okay. Um, Proverbs 13, 20, one of the wisest men said this. The one who walks with the wise will become wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. So what is he basically saying? He's saying another thing that could eat up our time are the people we choose to have relationships with. In other words, show me your friends and I will show you your future. I don't know if any of the people I went to high school with will be watching this stream today. I doubt it, but maybe one day they will. I had some really good friends, and I had some really extraordinary friends. Some friends were closer to God. Some weren't close to God at all. But when you're carnally minded, who are you most attracted to? Those probably who don't know God as well. Those who are maybe myopic, short-sighted. They are living for the moment, but they're not thinking of eternity over the things in the future. And I found myself getting caught up with some friends, some friends that desired to get into trouble, friends that were really funny, but at times led me astray. And I realized that I got so caught up in living for the moment that I wasn't really valuing my time for the future. I had some other friends that decided, you know what? I want to start a business. I want to start exercising. I want to start you know, playing, making good goals for the future. But then I kept found myself being caught up with the friends that wanted to live for the moment, hydrate themselves with things other than water, you know, doing things that were fun but led to bad habits. And I think it's at this time in Earth's history, you have to ask yourself, are my friends going to enhance my time or are they going to detract it and I'm going to have to pray that God will help me redeem the time because I've made so many bad mistakes. Now, if we look at Daniel's friends, what are some attributes? Uh, Where's my, where's my mic man? Can you hand out? If you, if you see some intelligent people here, which I think there are a lot, just maybe hand to, maybe we won't pick on the guests, but maybe a few of our students here. Let's, uh, let's hand out maybe, let's do three microphones. Because I'll be asking some people to read a few things off the screen for us. Let's get a little interactive. There's a few less of us here today. So when it comes to Daniel's friends, there are some things that we, that we can look at. Um, Dan, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, 
They were most likely raised by good parents. Not every good person has great parents. But when you're converted, God can make someone who isn't godly into a godly person, even if they haven't had an upbringing that is like God's. Also, you look at the paralytic's friends. Would you guys turn to Mark 2, 3 to 5? Mark 2, 3 to 5. And I want you to notice something here. Mark 2, 3 to 5. And this is dealing with the paralytic man. And as we look at the spirit of prophecy and things like this, we're told that is actually his sin that caused him to be in this condition that he was in. Mark 2, 3 to 5. And it says, And they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him, Jesus, because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was, so they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw his faith, is that what it says? Their faith. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, if you ask my class, I like to laugh, I like to smile, I like to joke around. And I think your friends should be able to make you laugh and smile. But is, is the substance of your friendship just joking around and laughing and smiling? Or do your friends actually pray for you? Are your friends there to listen to you when you're going through your stuff? Are your friends tempting you more towards the world? They want you to conform to the things of this world? Or do they want you to see you transformed by God? That's something you have to ask yourself. If you're an interested in someone and you're the only person that brings up spiritual things and the other person's kind of like, meh, I don't know. Is that a good, healthy relationship to be in? I don't know. Take it up with the Lord. But this paralytic's friends were so interested in his salvation and his healing that they went out of their way to even wreck someone's roof so that they could bring them closer to Jesus. Is that faith? Do your friends pray with you? Do your friends encourage you? Are they like Daniel's friends? When there is a, a crisis, when Nebuchadnezzar says, look at this situation, we're killing all the wise men, you don't see... Meshach saying, yo, I've got an uncle in Persia. We can steal a couple donkeys and make our way there. Let's go. No, no, no. They said, let's have a prayer meeting. Let's do something about this. Let's see what God is going to say. When the crisis comes, are your friends there to push you closer to God or to the world? Friends, your friends oftentimes will dictate the future and the direction that you are going to go in. I know as a dad, I was talking to Dean Chris. And we were talking about this 80% statistic. By the time, unless Jesus comes, by the time my daughter, who's three and a half right now, turns 12, I will have spent 80% of, of the time I'll ever spend with her when she's 12 years old. And you say, how is that possible? Well, if she continues to say she goes to an academy, or she ends up meeting a really nice boy, or she ends up getting a job, or she ends up moving away to go to school, all of a sudden it's going to be like, Spring break, Christmas break, she gets married, and then I'm just seeing her during the holidays. That's why I try to soak up as much time with her as possible. If you don't see me sometimes, I sneak away for 20 minutes. I go play with my daughter because I love her so much. And uh, we get to do all these really fun things together. And I realize that I want to pour as much Jesus on her as possible because I only have so much time with her. But she, she, Maria, you're not going to get married until like 35, right? You live with us? Okay. Please, okay. Anyway, so here's, so Stefan's going to hand out a few, uh, maybe th three mics. Maybe you could, we, we can pick on this side here. And I want to ask, you know, uh, if you're comfortable, uh, we're going we're gonna to look at a few quotes from the book, Christ's Object Lessons, that deal specifically with time. Because I'm doing most of the talk, and I want to hear from, maybe, would you be willing to read? Yeah. One over here. You're probably thinking, Adam, by this time you could have read the quote already, but it's okay. We're going to get people involved. So Sarai's going to read the first one. All right. And that's the, it's the green mic there for you, Mr. Benson. Right. Our time belongs to God. Every moment is his, and we are under the most solemn obligation to improve it to his glory. Of no talent he has given will he require a more strict account than of our time. Amen, amen. Pick on another person there. Sure. I think Vaughn. Vaughn's a good reader. Pick on him. Okay. 
Okay, and he's got the yellow mic. I think it's my, is it off? It's on, you good, go ahead. The only way in which we can redeem our time is by making the most of that which remains, by being co-workers with God in his great plan of redemption. Amen. Okay, I'll do the next one here. It says, upon the right improvement of our time depends our success in acquiring knowledge and mental culture. The cultivation of the intellect need not be prevented by poverty, humble origin, or unfavorable surroundings. If a book were kept at hand and these fragments of time were improved in study, reading, or careful thought, what might not be accomplished? A resolute purpose, persistent industry, and careful economy of time will enable men and women to acquire knowledge and mental discipline, which will qualify them for almost any position of influence and usefulness. So God says if we use our time wisely, if we bring with us God's promises, we're constantly dwelling upon them, constantly memorizing them, that it actually prepares us for basically any situation in life. Uh, Stefan, you want to read the last one? I'll pick on you. He's got the, the green one. The value of time is beyond computation. Christ regarded every moment as precious, and it is thus that we should regard it. Life is too short to be trifled away. We have but a few days of probation in which to prepare for eternity. We have no time to waste, no time to devote to selfish pleasure, no time for the indulgence of sin, and it is now that we are to form characters for the future immortal life. It is now that we are to prepare for the searching judgment. Mm. Thank you so much. So, does God value time? Yes. I know when I was a little kid in elementary school, we're, we can put those down, thank you so much. When I was a little kid in elementary school, it felt like time was like molasses. It's the middle of November, it's minus 40 degrees outside, and I just can't wait for recess. But when you hit 30, something happens. I don't know, it's just the time-space continuum. I'm just making up words right now, and it feels that things are just going so quickly that next thing you know, your daughter is crawling, and now she wants to drive, you know? And so it's pretty amazing um, what will happen. It's just things go so fast, and you blink, and things change. So I think it's important for us to remember, just as we know that we are in the hour of judgment and time is running out, I was actually reading from this, um, from this book called Last Day Events, and it was talking about judgments that were going to be coming upon the world. And this is what some of the people in the community said to some of the people who understood prophecy at this time. This is what they said. You knew that the judgments of God were coming upon the earth and then essentially said they were agonizing. You knew. Why didn't you not tell us? Why did, why did you not tell us? We did not know. Why are you so ashamed of sharing what you believe? Friends, we know that time's running out. And here's the thing. You know, if I was, if I had tens of thousands of dollars for every single person here, and I said, I wanted to give it to you, I don't think anyone would say, you know, I don't know, I, I can't accept that from you. But if I'm offering something like a gift of salvation, which God has given you, and saying, look, I really want you to, think, to accept this thing, it's going to be harder for people to understand, because getting something for free in this world almost seems like a scam. But when you look at salvation, we know that it is true. So friends, what I'm saying is this, if we've been given a mission, we've been given the Spirit of God, we've been given... Uh, truth for these last days, we have nothing to be ashamed of. We should be using our time to best equip people for the soon coming of our Savior. There was a story where these men were building a well, or digging a well. I guess that would be the more accurate saying. And this is what uh, this author says in the book, Gospel Workers, page 32. In a town in New England, a well was being dug. When the work was nearly finished, while man was still at the bottom, while one man was still at the bottom, the earth caved in and buried him. Instantly, the alarm was set out, and mechanics, farmers, merchants, lawyers hurried breathlessly to rescue. Ropes, ladders, spades, and shovels were brought by eager, willing hands. Save him, oh, save him, was the cry. Men worked with desperate energy till the sweat stood on, in beads upon their brows, and they, their arms trembled with exertion. At length, a pipe was thrust down through which they shouted to the man to answer if he was still alive. The response came, alive, but make haste, or hurry up. It is fearful in here. With a shout of joy, they renewed their efforts, and at last he was reached and saved, and the cheer that went up seemed to pierce the very heavens. He is saved, echoed throughout every street in the town. This was too great, this, was this too great zeal and interest? 
Too great enthusiasm to save just one man? It surely was not, but what is the loss of temporal life in comparison with the loss of a soul? If the threatened loss of life will arouse in human hearts a feeling so intense, should not loss of a soul arouse even deeper solicitude in men who claim to realize the danger of those apart from Christ? Shall not the servants of God show a great zeal in laboring for the salvation of souls as was shown from the life of one man buried in a well? So friends, this is a wake-up call to us. There is a world dying for something, and we know that what they need is Jesus, and we have the answer. Are we afraid to share it? Friends, if there is going to be so much zeal just to save one life, friends, there should be even a greater zeal to save lives for eternity. I guess something that we said in our junior Bible class, we we talked about this, and this was a line that was actually on one of the quizzes, and it says, as we were, as where we are in Earth's history, we should know the times we are living. Yes, we should keep our eyes on how things are happening in prophecy, but we also need to know the Savior personally. And the thing is, if we spend, oops, if we spend all our time focusing on just the things, on the times of what's going on in the world, and we don't focus on the Savior, what happens? We're just become, you know, alarmists, and we're just focused on what's going on, on focusing on things that we can't control. The only thing we can control is how much time we spend with Him, right? We can't control the craziness of the world, but we can control the time we spend with Jesus. And so this day, I pray that maybe you will look into your hearts today and say, how much time am I spending with my family? How much time am I spending with my Savior? How much time am I spending with my friends? And if I'm spending time with these friends, are they bringing me closer to God or are they bringing me away from him? And so these are things that we need to ask ourselves because we know that time is short. So in conclusion, as we finish this sermon, as the praise team probably comes up to do the last um, song, I just want to thank you guys for taking the time to see that where we are in, in, in prophecy, understanding that, look, time is a gift. There's three score and ten. We don't know how many days we have left. I know there's been times with, where I've met people where there was a guy I used to work with, and he valued time. I remember he wanted to know Jesus, and we worked in this warehouse together, and as we would talk together, he, he really, really wanted to know more about God, so I gave him all these DVDs. Those were things that people used to use 15 years ago. We don't use them anymore. But I gave him these Bible DVDs, and he started watching them. He started watching them. And he had this relative that came to town. And his relative said, hey, we need to go to this street where all these bars and taverns are because I want to spend some time with you. And the crazy thing about this guy, his name was Juan. He's, I don't... I've tried to keep in touch with him, but you'll hear how difficult it is after the story. Juan, who didn't drink, he was giving up marijuana, he wanted a fresh start in life, decided, I'm going to go one back, back one last time with my cousin, who's a party animal. And he's standing on the street, and a drunk driver comes by and hits him. And then the drunk driver doesn't realize it, and then backs over him. And now he's a paraplegic, and he can't walk, he can't talk, he's completely um, incapacitated. And I'm, I would try to visit him when I lived in this, in this city, in this town, and it broke my heart because what he was doing was he was using his time well because he wanted to know God, he wanted to spend time with his friends and his family, but he made one little exception, and that was a little door that was opened up, and it seemed like the enemy got in. Now, I don't know. I'm not saying he can't be saved. I don't know. He can't communicate. But I will say this, friends, we know where we are in Earth's history. Let's not, let's not waste our time. We went through the quotes from the book, Christ Object Lessons. Let's use our time. Let's redeem the time because the days are evil. God bless you. God loves you. And we'll see you next Sabbath. Um, so I'm going to please ask everyone to sing along with us the closing hymn. Oh, and please stand uh, to sing the hymn 448.
Father, we sing this song about this trumpet that's going to sound, and it reminds us that it's speaking of those who have no, no longer time on this earth, that they're sleeping and resting for the resurrection day. And Father, I just pray that as we studied time in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, that we would use it uh, to the utmost, not for our own selfish pleasure, pleasures, but to glorify you and to bring others into a relationship with you. Uh, Father, may you just help us redeem the time as we search our hearts to see where maybe we waste our time, that you would give us a renewed vigor to prioritize you more than anything or anything that more than we've ever done in our lives. So, Father, please um, bless us with your presence. Please send your spirit to protect us, your angels to guard us. And, Lord, may we have divine appointments to share your light with this world. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.